Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Noah Falstein, uh, Chief Game Designer at Google. And uh, this is a talk about transmogrified reality, which is an odd name, but I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, first, just a, a little bit of background. Uh, I've been in the games industry a, a very long time and uh, worked on uh, games for, for companies that were small companies when they started, became big companies uh, later. I, I got into the habit of that. Then I was a freelancer for many years, and uh, just in the last two years I've been at Google, and uh, it's been uh, quite an experience working for a large company like that. But the bottom line is uh, games, even though they're changing all the time, and that's one of the wonderful things I'll be talking about, there also are a lot of things that you can learn that are the same, and hopefully I'll be passing on some useful knowledge to you about what I've found really works over the years uh, to keep going. And in addition, I'm also going to be giving some surfing lessons, which uh, is particularly odd since I've never actually surfed, and uh, although I, I had a trip to Hawaii recently, the, the waves were so rough they weren't even letting people swim, but we'll explain that in a bit. Um, First of all, the games industry, uh, I, I think if you've been listening to some of the talks here and uh, the panel I was on yesterday, in general, people are really very positive about the way things are going right now. The games industry is, uh, that's not good, excuse me. That was weird. Okay. Um, games industry is, generally trending up, and uh, it, it's been very positive recently uh, in almost every respect. Uh, I've worked a lot in PC games over the years, and it's hard to count the number of times that people have told us that PC games are dead and we should just abandon them all. Um, but I, originally I had labels on some of these ups and downs. Uh, I talked about how early in my career uh, there was a boom in arcade games, and I worked on, on arcade video games, and then within Less than a year, we lost 90% of the audience, uh, just really lost interest in going to the arcades. But then there was a rise in consoles, and the first Nintendo came out, and home PCs were doing well, and, and then they weren't doing well for a while, but then the next generation came in. So it goes up and down. And the fact is, for each of us in the industry, it's a different story. You know, you may have actually been laid off from a company at the height of one of the peaks of the games industry because that's the way the, the industry works. Or conversely, you might have had your best successes at a time when most people were complaining about how difficult it was. The bottom line is, even with the ups and downs, the trend has been upward, and recently I think we're in the best shape that we've ever been. It's a very exciting time to be making games. But even with these ups and downs, there are some that are exceptional. Uh, some peaks that have really made a, a huge difference. That, to some extent, in the games industry, we focus on consoles and new console releases and how uh, when a new game console or new new generation of game consoles comes out, often that shows that, that things are going well and usually not right when they come out, but within a year or two later, there's all sorts of wonderful news stories about how great the industry is going and, and uh, how positive it all is. Um, and game consoles, uh, going back you know, to the early ones, uh, in even the late 70s and certainly early 80s, really took a combination of a lot of different technologies coming together at once. In that case, the first practical, inexpensive microprocessors, and the fact that people had televisions in their home and that you could, without having to get a dedicated computer display, hook these game consoles up to your TV and play a game, which sounds you know, completely uh, unimportant and, and not remarkable now, but in those days it was actually quite an extraordinary thing that a television that up to that point had only had one specific use suddenly became a display for this, these game systems and then later for home computers. Um, the World Wide Web, uh, the, the internet has been around for quite a long time, and, and when I was at Lucasfilm Games in the, the mid-80s, we had a lot of computer scientists who had come in uh, in, in the, uh, it was basically Lucasfilm's computer division that we were all part of, and they introduced a lot of us to the internet, and we were sending email at that point. 
uh, in order to send email in the mid-80s, you actually needed to know the names of every computer along the stages between the one you were on and the one that you, the person you were sending email was, and you, you would put those in with little exclamation marks, so each email address was essentially direct instructions to the computer of how to route it. And we would get magazines, and you know, every month they would have a new map, and we'd happily look to see if there was some shortcut now that would cut a computer or two out of the, the links to our favorite uh, correspondence. Not, not a great thing by today's standards, but it was pretty amazing. I remember being able to just send an email to somebody and get a response back four or five hours later. And uh, normally with regular mail, of course, it would take days. So that kind of thing was, was impressive, but you know, nobody except you know, nerds like us would get excited about having to go through all that complication. So when the World Wide Web came along, what had happened is that graphic cards had gotten better so you could actually get visual displays on the computers and more and more people had them on their computers, as well as modems. And both of those things were driven largely by the games industry, the increased quality of graphics and uh, the fact that a lot of the, the early point-to-point -point games or hooking up to a bulletin board so that you could download games uh, or, or play and talk to your friends online, which was actually more often the case, those were things that really were pushed by the, the games industry. But when the World Wide Web came out, obviously it had implications way beyond the games industry and continues to, to have reverberations even now. And then uh, another really big one was the incorporation of smartphones. It's hard to believe that it was only about eight years ago that we started to have smartphones. And I, you know, it certainly changed my life to be able to travel with one. In fact, I, I travel with two these days. And uh, smartphones, again, processors had to get faster and faster, but new technologies needed to be available. Touch screens that originally were uh, desktop size had to shrink down and be portable and light enough and inexpensive enough to be put on a phone. Uh, same kind of thing with higher resolution displays. And as with every one of these things, faster processors uh, less expensive processors, lower power processors in this case that could also work on a phone and only drain the battery in a day and not an hour. Um, all of that came together and smartphones have been a huge boon to the games industry, but there are a few other uses as well. So it's nice to see that sometimes these big changes come and they help the games industry and they go on beyond that. But Transmogrified reality, what does that all mean? Well, first of all, the word transmogrify. Um, this is an unusual word, but uh, certainly not one I made up. It's been around for a long time. And the basic definition is to transform, in a, especially in a surprising or magical manner. And that just, as I was looking around for words that I thought could help describe what's happening now, this seemed to be one of the best descriptions. We're reaching a point where we've been talking about virtual reality for over 30 years. Um, uh, does anyone here know who, who coined the term virtual reality originally? Uh, who said that? Very good. You, you win a um, Google Cardboard. Um, here, I'm going to put this down here. You can come up and grab it. Um, yeah, Jaron Lanier came to, uh, at, when I was at Lucasfilm Games, he was a friend of one of our uh, engineers, and he came out and showed us this visual programming language he had developed that he was really excited about because the idea was that you could actually program using icons. And he had also created this glove called a data glove that you could wear that would allow you to sort of reach into the computer screen and manipulate the icons. And he was doing this and looking at the screen and really intent on what was going on. And we were all staring at the glove because this idea of being able to kind of combine your real world body with the virtual world was so exciting to us. And it didn't take him long to realize that that was the important thing of what he was doing and, and get into virtual reality. Um, but it's taken a long time, it's been very slow. And a lot of people, even at this conference, have come up to me and said, you know, I don't really believe that we're ready for some revolution. I've been hearing about this for a long time, and it's always far in the future, even though everyone thinks it's about to come. And I, I was skeptical like that even as recently as about six months ago. But the demos that I've seen since then and the changes that have happened in the industry and what shipped, I think, have, have really changed my mind, and I hope will change yours. One analogy I like to use 
is that this idea of mixing the real world and virtual images, we've already seen what happens with movies, that movies have been around for over 100 years, and the earliest ones, even some of the very earliest ones, use special effects, but they never really looked anything like the real thing. They were more of a, a kind of a metaphor for what they were trying to show, and then Gradually over time, you know, as, as movies got better, sometimes some of those effects would actually be pretty dramatic, uh, particularly when people discovered things like blue screens and ways that they could actually make it look like people were in a different environment. But even then, for the first 10 years or so, 20 years that they were using those technologies, if you worked in that industry, or as I did, if you worked with people from that industry who could point things out, you could tell, you could see the, the little halos around people that was a dead giveaway that it wasn't really in, you know, they weren't really hanging off a cliff, they were in some sound stage and, and perfectly safe. And then computer graphics came along and better and better quality imagery until it became really difficult to tell. And then in the last 10, 15 years, uh, I found it impossible you know, I know that they didn't actually have a camera out at Mars that to, to film those uh, sequences, but it looks absolutely real from what I've been able to see. So I think we're on that same pathway. I don't think we're at that point where you just can't tell the difference between you know, a virtual image and a, a reality, but it does feel to me that we're heading in that direction. Uh, with what we've seen as virtual and augmented reality, uh, a lot of that technology has come together. There are a lot of these augmented reality things use tags. Uh, they have to have special uh, images or uh, sort of QR codes that are, are stuck on walls and floors to be able to orient themselves. But we're moving beyond that, as I'll show you. Uh, there's a company called Cast AR that does an interesting thing where they don't require tags, but they do require this special material. It's a retro-reflective material that bounces light right back at you. That's a, a, an interesting approach, very different than what a lot of other people are doing. But the bottom line is there are all these different pathways that are converging on just making it work to, to bring together these virtual images and the real world images. Uh, I've been lucky enough to see what Magic Leap is doing in Florida. They're one of the more exciting companies. And uh, you know it's just amazing. Uh, unfortunately, I can't talk about how they do it or what's going on in detail. But uh, if you look online, you'll see that people have seen that. People, I'm sure many of you have seen not only the, the uh, uh, DK2 version of Oculus Rift, but their Crescent Bay. And uh, I've played with the HTC Vive uh, Valve system. It's just uh, extraordinary. If you haven't tried one of these high-end systems yet, believe me, I think when you do, it will change your mind about the quality of VR. Uh, and maybe portability is an issue, but let me address that. So all these different things are coming together to create this transmogrified reality uh, revolution that I believe is coming. And I've, I've gotten into a lot of the details of that. There's, there's more I could talk, particularly about head-mounted displays and challenges of making uh, powerful batteries or figuring out ways to have a light head-mounted display so that you can actually see some of these things. Uh, the Google Cardboard that I just gave away is a really interesting thing that we at Google have done. Just came out less than a year ago, but the idea is that you have this less than $20 uh, combination of cardboard and some simple lenses and a magnet, and you put your phone in and look through it almost like binoculars, and it gives you a virtual reality uh, a vision that for most people, because they already have the phones, it's an extremely cheap way to experience virtual reality. For developers, it's a relatively easy way to get into it. And granted, your phone and you know, the range of phones that we accept is quite large. It won't be as powerful as a dedicated system, but you know, having somebody only have to spend $20 versus you know, hundreds or thousands is worth quite a bit in getting them introduced to this. And this isn't a new idea. As I said, this has been kicking around a long time. And even before I met Jaron Lanier, I remembered seeing a cartoon. And I, I tried to hunt down the uh, book that I had seen this in. And luckily, I remembered the name of the uh, developer. It was a game developer that I knew back in the early 80s who actually drew these cartoons and tracked him down to get this. This was the view in 1983 of what the far future of games might look like. And uh, the interesting thing, you know, it was pretty funny at the time, but the reality is if you watch somebody with a modern VR headset, it doesn't look all that different than that. And uh, it was interesting to see how even then we thought this was coming. 
Um, so what's different? Why are we really ready for this now? Well, one of the things that I think is going to be a component that will make a lot of this sort of stuff possible is Google's Project Tango. Uh, I, I'm curious, uh, could people raise their hands if, if is, does anybody have a Tango development kit? Because I know we have some out here in Germany. No? How many people have heard of Project Tango before or watched a video? Okay, a bit more of you, and uh, in a few minutes it will be all of you. Um, so Tango is a project that came from our acquisition of a research group at Motorola. And uh, the idea is to give devices a human scale understanding of their surroundings uh, so that they can kind of perceive where they are and be able to, uh, from a depth of about half a meter out to three meters, measure how far away images are. Uh, I'll explain more about the details. But I think the, the best way to give you a sense of it uh, this is just one element of what I'm calling transmogrified reality, but uh, I think an important one. So let me play the video, and I will talk over this so that I can um, give you a sense of what you're seeing here. Uh, this is all real stuff. This, these are not uh, you know, graphics to make it all uh, look like it's working. Uh, you can see somebody walking through the Motorola building, and this is from about a year ago. They've improved the technology since then and a five-story building, they go and walk through it, and in real time, it can keep track of where they are with six degrees of freedom and less than a 1% uh, error rate as it moves through. Or you can strap it to a helmet and ride around on your bicycle and combine GPS and large-scale data with more fine tracking data. And it's really extremely fast. Uh, if you take it on a roller coaster, you can see the images of the roller coaster on the left, but take a look at that little cone on the right, and it's perfectly tracking and knows exactly which way the device is looking as it goes through that. And in a similar way, and this is obviously very important for what we're looking at in the future, you can make a cloud of points, or that little white star on the left-hand side is a virtual star, but they're very well integrated into the real world, so you can see that with the Tango device, you can create virtual objects that look like they're sitting in real space. And even if you're in a crowded room with a lot of people moving around who are not very good to track on, it's quite good at keeping uh, its sense of place and throwing out the data that it, it doesn't like that's uh, moving or doesn't give it a, a, a strong signal. And because of that, we have something called area learning where it can look around and with a variety of cameras and sensors can actually in real time scan in your surroundings, uh, in this case a, a room in a house, and it's doing that with the depth sensing, it's doing that with a black and white camera to get a wide angle view, and a color camera to get the color information so that you can actually see stuff uh, and combine those to create, in this case, a, uh, a real time 3D view of that, that world. And in a similar way, uh, this is something that we have running in, in Unity that adds in physics to that same kind of real-time mapping. So these balls are being fired out, and they'll actually go straight through into the blackness until the scanner gets a little closer and can see there's a wall there, and they instantly start bouncing off the wall instead of uh, flying away. So this is a very versatile system. There's a lot of things that we believe can be done with it, and people are just scratching the surface. You know, one more is indoor positioning and directions. This is one of our buildings at uh, Mountain View office in Google. We have a lot of conference rooms, and it's always difficult to know where to go when you're new to a conference room. So this thing puts an augmented reality arrow on the floor and leads you through the office, around the corners, right to the room that uh, you've input at the beginning to, to find your way there. This is, uh, not surprisingly, the office building that Tango's in now. Um, so that gives you a sense of some of what's possible. The guy who is responsible originally for Project Tango and runs the, the group is Johnny Lee, who got a lot of fame within the games industry some years ago by taking some Wii controllers and taking the sensor from, from the Wii and actually using it as sort of a head mount so that he could then create images that, that could track uh, his head and change the perspective. Tango is kind of a natural outgrowth of some of that early research that he did of what would happen if devices, rather than just being uh, hacked together, were actually designed from the ground up to have that kind of sense. The three things that you saw demonstrated there are, are motion tracking. And most phones, and this is how our cardboard works, have three degrees of freedom where it knows as you rotate around which way to look. 
but it can't really tell the difference between looking this way and going up and down or you know, basically the other three degrees. Tango it has better gyroscopes and uh, accelerometers and combines that with the other sensors in it to create a full uh, motion tracking with six degrees of freedom. And one of those key sensors is an infrared depth sensor so that unlike just being able to see images, which most systems can do and have to guess at how far away things are, it can actually scan and tell the depth of things, even in real time with people walking around. It's actually kind of fun to watch these ghostly images of people that it's able to track. And then it combines those things and over successive passes can actually refine its image of a given area. If I were to try and scan in this room with a three meter range, I couldn't just go like that and get the whole room, but I could actually walk through and scan quite a bit of it uh, and map out the floor bit by bit, and it will remember that area and recognize when you come back to the same spot and reinforce and give you higher detail for that area. So all that stuff is pretty amazing, but what's it going to mean in terms of applications? Well, uh, let me give you just a, a few ideas here. Um, one of them, I think, will start outside of the games industry, uh, just real estate of apartment sales and rentals or home sales. I think it's going to become almost standard issue to have a device uh, that has these capabilities in the very near future because of the kinds of things that you can do that will be just so useful that I think it's going to be hard to compete with people who don't have this capability. So you go into a new apartment, you scan it in, it's empty. You go to a client's house, you scan in their furniture or their appliances, and now you can show them what it would look like in this new apartment. Or, oh, your bed is, is a large bed, it won't quite fit in this bedroom. Let's try this other apartment. Oh, that's beautiful. What would the view look like out of the window from when you're waking up in the morning? Well, let's, let's walk it over here and look through the window of the tango, and there you go. That's your, your view out the, uh, the window of your apartment. And think about also the advertising and sales possibilities of, Yes, you've got this refrigerator, but you, know, you could actually get a brand new one. And in fact, look at how well it would fit in with your uh, space here and with your, we, you, we can change the color until it matches the other appliances you have and put in an order that'll be ready when you move in. That kind of thing I think is going to be quite a revolution for people in those industries and, and quite a few others. This is an example, uh, there's a great video online if you search a bit under Project Tango that shows this room being scanned out and processed so that they can get a pretty high resolution view of it. And one of the exciting things about this capability is the idea that people can actually scan in the spaces where they live, where they work, and use those to play in or maybe share them with friends. And that's going to make a lot of really exciting things possible, uh, some you know, certainly non-game uh, aspects. But think about stealth games. You know, Stealth games right now, you control the computer and you send an avatar through a, a dangerous area trying to you know, carefully use your, your mouse and your keypad to try and keep them or your, your game controller to keep them from bumping into things or moving too quickly. Well, with the Tango, the sensors in it can tell whether it's being moved too quickly. And you can, for example, have a laser maze and perhaps even combine it with our Android TV projections so that you can actually look at your TV to see those lasers and be moving through it as you go. And it knows how fast you're turning, how fast you're moving. So if you go faster than, oh, I don't know, half a meter per second or whatever it is that you find is the, the right stealth speed, uh, then the guards are alerted and suddenly you have to freeze. And if your nose itches, then you know, just like in the real world, if you, if you scratch it and jiggle the tango, then you're going to be in trouble. Um, it could bring up just one idea there, but there are so many different things you can do when it's not just that it lets you see into a virtual world, but it is a controller in itself that knows exactly where it is in the world and how it's being moved. So let's see what else do we have here. Well, one of my favorite ideas is scanning in the, the place that you live, and you can do that in many ways. You know, perhaps you, you, the, we love German board games all over the world. You imagine a kitchen table, and you can have an endless supply of games just through the viewer in your uh, Tango device because they could all appear to be on that table. But that's pretty boring. You could also you know, just get the real games and uh, help the German economy, so I, I don't want to cause trouble there. But imagine that you take one of our computer games and you have a battlefield laid out now so that you can actually zoom in just by bringing the tablet in on the table 
Uh, and it doesn't have to be one-on-one. -on -one. It can be that you know, every centimeter that you move it vertically is uh, you know, 100 meters of vertical access, so you can actually see an entire battlefield, zoom in on an individual soldier, and then pull it back out just by moving it uh, right around the tabletop. Or if war isn't your thing, imagine something like The Sims or more like a dollhouse where you can actually have that on your physical space and see what's happening and see the animated characters through this viewer, possibly hook in your salt shaker or your toaster and have those appear as something else in the process. Uh, you know, maybe the, the salt shaker is a street light and you can actually have your characters driving along and you can change the light by rotating your, your shakers. There are so many different possibilities there. But also, uh, you can scan in your bedroom, for example, and do a, an adventure game or possibly a, a suspense horror game where there are monsters coming out of the closet and tentacles coming out from under the bed and when you open a drawer, something pops out and tries to eat you. And then when that gets a little too intense, you just turn the game off and you're still in exactly the same room with the same closet, that same bed. And I think that kind of thing you know, shows some of the emotional impact that being able to play in your own room can have. And if that's a little too intense, then imagine storybooks, uh, children's books, for quite a while, we've had books that you can read and animate on the screen, but imagine if through that screen, you can hold it up and the camera sees the room around it, and your child can be looking at trees growing in the walls or their favorite character coming and sitting on the chair in their room as you're reading the story to them and seeing what happens uh, acted out in real life. Some sort of procedural thing where it scans in some empty space almost as a stage in the bedroom. So as you're there on the bed reading to a child, you can get the whole story acted out right in front of them in their room. Uh, so lots of things from you know, pretty much every end of, of the uh, spectrum. I'm realizing I forgot to mention a little bit about how the tango does this. Uh, let me just show you in person. It's a, a somewhat difficult thing to, to demo uh, live because you have to have the point of view of the person using it, so I won't get into that, but this is one of our Tango tablets. And you can see it looks very much like a regular 7-inch uh, Android tablet, and in fact, it, it does do that, although this is still a sort of development prototype tool and, and not a, a finished commercial product. Um, but it has this thicker strip along the top, and that's partly so that you can hold it this way and it keeps the sensors free. It has a 120-degree black and white camera that is part of what you saw in those video clips of being able to see a very wide range and catch edges and uh, tag, you know, make those little dots appear to let it uh, construct a point cloud of the area around it. And to verify what those actually are, it has in a little infrared emitter and detector that does the uh, depth sensing that I mentioned. And then there's a regular camera, just like all phones and tablets have now, that gives you the color information and is great for augmented reality because when you saw that demo of going through the offices, everything except those blue arrows were visuals from the camera and the blue arrows were put in perspective at the right uh, size and, and um, position to actually appear that they're on the floor through the 3D sensors in real time. Um, so amazing stuff that's possible even now with these early development kits. You know, I'm very excited about what will happen as it uh, moves into the, the real world, um, or the commercial world, I should say. So one last uh, image. When I talk about transmogrified reality, one of the things that I really see in the future, and I think the not too distant future, I expect we'll be seeing uh, first stages of this within the next year or two, is, uh, excuse the badly photoshopped picture here, but just to give you the sense that you have the real world, and you can let that shine through, uh, but it doesn't have to be the real world. You know, your table can actually be a rock. This can be an outdoor scene. Uh, perhaps you're a Tolkien fan and you want to turn your dining room into the inn at Bree and have your friends look like elves and hobbits and, and uh, dwarves. Um, or possibly you have a dinner party and you invite your friends over, but in the empty seats you can fill them up with Albert Einstein or Marilyn Monroe or you know, pick the, the movie star of your choice. Or maybe you make your Aunt Sophie look like Marilyn Monroe because it's more fun to imagine her that way. It's up to you. 
Uh, and a lot of that, I think there will be many technical challenges to solve before it's really practical, but we're getting very close to this seamless mixing of, of virtual and real that I mentioned. Um, in order to make that happen, now you notice I've talked, gone from this, this handheld tablet talking about virtual reality. Google Cardboard uh, is a uh, very inexpensive device, as I described. Uh, we had, uh, we, the last numbers we announced were early December, we talked about having uh, shipped half a million of these. And you're all witnesses now, you know, Google's very careful about numbers, but it's quite clear that now there's at least 500,001 uh, that are out in the world today. And that was from releasing it, first announcing it in June and making it available shortly after to December. So I leave it to you to extrapolate. Uh, I hope we'll have some other good numbers for you soon. Um, but the idea of a head-mounted display that lets you put a phone in, if that phone, for example, uh, in some future version had the Tango technology attached to it, like one of the early uh, Tango prototypes you saw mounted on that, that helmet of the person on the bicycle. The idea that this device could let the real world through with the camera, but it's a completely virtual screen, so it can also add in things in that real world. Now, the problem that a lot of systems have, and particularly mobile systems, is that how do they know where that real world is? All they have is a flat image. But of course, with the Tango technology, it has the depth sensing and it's able to make those point clouds and lock things in. Certainly a lot of technical challenges before we're able to do this in a commonplace way. But this is part of why I said at the beginning, there are so many different companies attacking this from many different directions, getting these really exciting results that uh, I think we're, we're getting there. So what about that timing? You know, what should you do about it? Well, I mentioned we'd be doing surfing lessons here again. And the trick is uh, there are a lot of really interesting parallels between what somebody has to do to learn how to surf and how you survive in the games industry, you know, not the least of which is the idea that you have these waves of innovation. You know, if you saw that graph at the beginning, it almost looked like gradually increasing waves. Um, I, as I said, am not really a surfer, but having talked to quite a few, and I actually made a game about surfing because, hey, you know, as game developers, you don't actually have to do all those things. I, I know a lot of my friends who do sports games are not exactly, uh, you know, great athletes. Um, but there's a, a big question about timing with surfing. Uh, you can see we have one person up there who looks like they're doing really well and a lot of others who it's a little bit uncertain. You know, there's this whole group there that one can expect has gone out and ridden some small waves in and now this big wave is coming and it looks like they're going to be engulfed. Well, that can be a little deceptive. The fact is if you get out there and you try it and you gain ex expertise as with anything else with surfing and certainly with new technologies and game development, making a lot of attempts and even having failures is often the best way to learn how to have successes at the next time. So getting out there and trying is good, but then you need to have enough energy or in the case of the real world and game development, that also translates to uh, not only physical energy, but the resources, the um, people and the, the money to actually proceed to keep going so that you don't blow everything on a very small wave and not get the kind of profits you need to stay self-sufficient. Um, sometimes you can almost be there at the big wave, but you're just not quite ready. Uh, or you get these people, you just see their heads sticking out who clearly missed it by quite a bit. The nice thing about that is that these waves of innovation, as with real waves, tend to travel in small groups. So it wasn't, for example, when the smartphones first came out, there were several hits. I remember a game called Flight Control. It was one of the earliest ones I saw on the iPhone that actually used the touch screen as part of the gameplay. And it did extremely well. They, they made it in a very short amount of time and made subsequent releases made it deeper, but they sold several million copies of that as a, a premium game. Not This is sort of before the free to play. But then, of course, you have things like Angry Birds that comes along. So, you know, they may have been the ones that missed that first wave with flight control, but you can see that they learned from what the people had gone before, and they kept practicing. And uh, Angry Birds, I think, was the 53rd game that Rovio worked on, and they were getting close to declaring bankruptcy about the time that happened. So that's part of the, the lesson of just keep trying, go out there, try a lot of waves, but look for the big one. Make sure you're in position. Um, 
being in position is great, but it's not everything. There is obviously the skill and quality of the team and of the game. And uh, even when you do everything right, you know, even when it looks like everything's perfect here, you know if this were a video, there'd be a good chance that the next frame would be this person falling over and the wave you know, coming over them, or possibly them winning the championship as they rode that wave into the shore. And that's a lot of what we have in the games world too. Uh, bottom line is, even though I've been very uh, bullish, very optimistic about where the games industry is right now and how well so many different things are, are going, as with all new things, uh, the, the Chinese character for crisis is made up of a combination of danger and opportunity combined. And that's such a wonderful way of talking about these crisis points that we reach, these really big waves of innovation. They can actually overwhelm you. You can put all of your effort and your company's money or your own effort and eat uh, you know, noodles for, for a year making a game, only to find that you release you know, two months after somebody else who has gotten it exactly at the right time or had the right sort of deal or the right sort of concept. And it's uh, a lot of danger there. But there's also tremendous opportunity. And those of you, I'm sure many have heard of the, the sort of blue ocean, red ocean strategies. This is a real blue ocean. There's a lot of stuff that can be tried. Uh, hopefully, I've given you some ideas for where some of these things can go. Certainly, there's not a huge installed base yet of virtual reality systems, but you know, half a million in last December of Google Cardboard isn't a bad place to start, and particularly if you're an independent or just a small uh, company, you can actually do quite well with that as your installed base. And as I say, it's growing all the time. Uh, so I want to leave you with the thought that what I've shown you here is just my concepts and some very conservative concepts of what this sort of technology could be used for. And not just Google's technology, but a lot of these emerging technologies all contribute to this in different ways. And I'd love to see what you're going to make out there. Uh, this is my, my uh, Twitter handle, and I'm happy to connect with you on LinkedIn, and that'll get you my email address as well. Uh, but please do use the browser version if possible so you can put in a little note and say, that you were at this conference and that's uh, what the context is because I get lots of uh, uh, applications and some of them are just from headhunters or other people that I don't particularly want to connect to. Uh, so with that, I think I'll do a few minutes of, of Q&A. Um, let's see if I'm doing all right on time. Yeah, so we've got uh, a good 10, 12 minutes to, to do some questions and answers. Um, and does anybody have any questions? Let's well, just see somebody being brave. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the 500K and first uh, cardboard kit. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I know the demos already, and it's, it's, it's really also the applications coming with the board are really very impressing. Um, I, I heard uh, or, or could read on the internet in the recent weeks that um, uh, Google seems to work on an Android VR version. Uh, could, you, could you tell us something about that? I'm really, I'm not sure what you're referring to, uh, ah. sorry. Um, yeah, there's nothing about that I can, I can say. Uh, I've, there are a lot of things that, that sometimes are misquoted, so I'm not sure what that was referring to. And I, 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 I'm sorry, but I can't speculate yeah. on that. Uh, okay, I just read in some industry uh, yeah, letters. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, so, so, yeah, so no sorry, concrete it's, it's project one of the, going on there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I, we have, as I say, uh, both Cardboard and Tango at Google. Uh, another, I mean, one of the announcements I can verify that actually just came out last week is that we have started a uh, works with cardboard program so that people who make uh, their own versions of cardboard, and in fact, I saw one downstairs uh, at, the, at the beginning of the show a couple days ago, um, can actually have those be authorized by Google. And not just an authorization, but we actually, there's a um, NFC code that, an NFC tag that is part of the cardboard. And, we are giving out specifications so that people who want to make their own versions of this, they might have a, a slightly different, uh, it's called interocular distance of, of where these uh, lenses are, different kinds of lenses, different types of phones, obviously, that people put in there. And all of those things can contribute to not having everything focused just right. 
so we have this NFC tag that we can code in there that will get the right combination for the phone that's put in there and for the, the box and the lenses and the distance uh, of everything to get the optimum performance. And along with that announcement, uh, I was happy to see that the, the two gentlemen that made uh, the 3D paint program called Tilt Brush that's been getting a lot of interest within the VR community recently have been hired to work with Google. And I worked with both of those people a couple of years ago when they were working for Double Fine, Tim Schafer's company, uh, and we had contracted with them to do some concept work for us, and they're just great guys, and uh, I'm a bit frustrated that the announcement came when I'm out here in Europe because uh, I'm looking forward to getting back and chatting with them about it. So we are moving quite a bit forward in those areas, but uh, that's, that's all I can uh, you know, tell you about right now. So, okay, two, two, two responses now from the same person. Surely there's somebody else here who, who's, who's feeling brave enough to ask a question. Even if there's a handout? Come on. Uh, I, I see, I knew you wanted to ask one. Uh, sorry, uh, maybe I didn't pay attention, but uh, this uh, Tango project, uh, it is based on an Android, or I mean, what kind of coding is that, or what kind of... Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, Android-based, and I, I'm sorry, I'm a game designer, it's been a long time, my, my programming experience is back in the dark ages, so I don't know a lot of detail, but I know that you can code for Tango with um, Java or C++. Uh, we have APIs that, that also, uh, as was demonstrated up there, work with Unity. So we're constantly making it easier and easier for developers to work with that. And if you just Google Project Tango and you'll find the, the main website that has a lot of information of how to order a development kit and also a little more about the APIs. And, um, I mentioned I'd been in Hawaii. I actually picked up a little surfing uh, coaster here that uh, I thought was appropriate for the talk. So as a, a thank you for... Another question, let me hand that out. And uh, I know that, uh, well actually let me ask a question of you before we go on to the next one. Um, how many people here uh, have played some of my old LucasArts adventure games like um, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis or one of the Secret of Monkey Island games. Ah, it was very nice. One of the reasons I love coming to Germany is that those games were more popular here than pretty much any other country in terms of uh, per capita. So, I, you know, happy to go off track and ans answer questions about that area as well. But, you know, first, are there anything else about Google and Tango and uh, transmogrified reality? I think I saw somebody about to ask one. There we go. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, are you involved with Ingress or Endgame in any way? And how does it, this proceed forward? Um, no, I'm not directly involved with Ingress. I do a lot of kind of cross work in gaming because there's not a, a gaming division of Google. Those of us who are interested in games have worked out an informal network, so I, I have worked with those people. Uh, they're actually in a, a separate office. Uh, so I, I can't say... Um, uh, uh, anything about what their their future plans are. I honestly don't know what they're they're expecting to do, but it has been noted by quite a few people that that uh, Ingress is uh, you know the biggest game that Google has has actually made, and it does involve a kind of augmented reality with the the portals that you have to capture that are situated in, in real space. Uh, I can certainly say that the the teams know of each other and they've been talking to each other, and you know I look forward to seeing what they come up with. Other questions? Towards the back there. Um, can you tell us something about the problem of motion sickness? Uh, did you solve this somehow? Because all the devices I tried out, I always got sick uh, after 10 minutes or something. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified to, to talk about the sort of medical side of things. What I can tell you from my own personal experience is that our uh, Project Cardboard uh, solution, uh, we found, I, I brought it to, to parties and shown it off to friends, and uh, find that it's remarkably good that way. We have a couple of reasons why we think this is the case. We, we've purposefully not put a strap on it so that when you hold cardboard up, you're holding it almost like a pair of binoculars. 
And I think that has two benefits. Uh, one that's more theoretical is just that that idea that you're sort of looking through something as with binoculars, you know, I don't know of anybody who, who can't look through binoculars because it makes them, them feel ill. Uh, and I think that's part of it is that psychologically it doesn't feel like you, your whole head is in a different space, but rather that you're looking into it. But perhaps you know, more clearly, one of the problems that comes up with virtual reality is when you make fast motions and there's a little latency, so you, you, you move your head quickly and even uh, you know, a tenth of a second later, the image suddenly snaps over, it's very disorienting. When you're holding it like this, you're actually restrained to how your torso moves. It's much smoother and slower, and we think that that may also be helpful for that. So all I can say is it's anecdotal at this point from my own experience. I don't know whether the team has done research on that, but uh, what I found is that for an inexpensive device, it actually seems to uh, work quite well and not cause problems for people. Um, but, of course, I, I, I can't uh, uh, speak for all the software that's out there. I'm, I'm certainly not familiar with it. Anything else? Okay, then. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I really appreciate being able to come out here. <laughs>